show again, everybody. Lance Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're about ready to go with more big action. Thank you very much, and welcome to Georgia Championship Wrestling. I'm Gordon Sully, your host, and we have quite an hour in store for us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Championship Wrestling at ringside. This is Vince McMahon along with wrestling's only living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television. I'm your host, Boyd Cheers, another outstanding card. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. That's right, it's 100% territory talk. And I'm your host, Ray Russell, wishing you all a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Boxing Day, and depending on when you hear this, Happy New Year, everyone. Seriously, happy holidays to all. Hope you're enjoying time with your loved ones during this holiday season. Hope you're staying safe and warm as well. This cyclone bomb has really affected a lot of people out there, yours truly included. So be sure to take care of one another. And after a very successful debut edition of the show, we continue on our journey through 1977 in the WWWF. And in this episode of Regional Wrestling's Territory Talk, special guest co-host, Stick to Wrestling's own John McAdam, returns as we spend some time discussing Superstar Graham and his reign as champion, from his title win against Bruno San Martino to many of his challengers, to his touring of other territories with the WWF title belt. We'll also take a look at Bruno San Martino's post-championship run, including his rematches with Graham for the WWF Championship. We'll also look at the tag teams of 1977, including the new tag team champions of Mr. Fuji and Professor Toru Tanaka, plus Larry Zabisco and Tony Gurria. And with Billy White Wolf out, Chief J. Strongbow finds himself a new partner in the High Chief Peter Maivia. All of that and so much more. Join us as we once again talk the territories. And a reminder, you can listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast and our sister shows like the Wrestling Memory Grenade where we're currently covering our 1987 in the WWF project over there, and on Monday Warfare, The Battles Within, where we talk the weekly breakdown of the Raw vs. Nitro feud. Right now on Warfare, we're just days away from the debut of the NWO at the Bash of the Beach, a hot time to get caught up on previous episodes leading in to that big pay-per-view. And you can listen to all of our podcasts as part of the WrestleCopia brand on the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, that's at WrestleCopia.com, that's WrestleCopia.com, and everywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Google Pod, and beyond. And be sure to give us a follow on social media so you guys can stay up to date with the latest goings on with the WrestleCopia brand, and I'm also constantly adding new old school wrestling pictures and videos on social media all the time. You can follow us on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade, that's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade, Also, follow and like us at Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And while you're at it, you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade, always adding new footage as I continue to preserve my VHS collection by converting it all to digital. And last but not least, before we get things going, I'd like to ask you all to check out our Patreon account. That's over at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That's Patreon.com slash wrestle c-o-p-i-a multiple tiers to choose from but i recommend the very affordable five dollar all access tier gets you all kinds of gifts including my insanely detailed show notes for the wrestling memory grenade for monday warfare and now also for the regional wrestling podcast as well you'll also receive early access to many of our wrestlecopia brand podcasts listen days sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners like this particular episode of Regional Wrestling, dropped a week early just for our patrons. Also part of the all-access tier, enhanced versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade Show covering the 1989 and the NWA project. And what do those enhanced versions include? Not only do you get enhanced sound quality, but new conversations, original topics edited out of the initial broadcast due to time restraints, edited right back in. But it doesn't end there. You'll also get... Digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. More digital downloads than ever. Going up this holiday season, another great reason to become a patron right now. But that's not all. Of course, also as part of the all-access tier, 
you receive the Patreon-exclusive Watch Along series, covering many past WWF and WCW pay-per-views, Saturday Night's Main Events, Clash of the Champions, Coliseum videos, and more. Plus, coming very soon, January 2023, a special WrestleMania 3 Watch Along, currently in the works. Plus, other random extras as well. You get all of that for the low, low price of just $5. No subscription. Cancel any time. Give it a go for a month, and I think you'll like the content we offer. And every penny of it, guys, goes right back in to the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. So help keep shows like the Wrestling Memory Grenade and the Regional Wrestling Podcast up and running for the months and the years to come. And with all of that out of the way, we resume our discussion of 1977 in the WWWF. And it's at this point we welcome back to the show. He is the host of the Stick to Wrestling podcast as part of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network and located over at mcadampod.com and everywhere your streaming needs are met. He is the one and only, the raw-boned and wicked good, Mr. (laughs) John McAdam. Welcome back to the show, John. Ray, one thing I wish I had done before we started recording today, and this dawned on me, like okay. literally as I'm putting on my headset, like I wish I had listened to the first part of this podcast like last night so that okay. I know what I said and I'm not you know, repeating things like the <laughs> doddering idiot that I am. Uh, so I will do my best to not be that way. But if I, if I mention something that I already talked about, I apologize to you and your audience in advance. Well, we forgive you, John, because you are John McAdam after all. And before we get rolling, I just want to remind everyone, you guys can follow John on Twitter at CC Milani. That's at C-C-M-I-L-A-N-I. Or just look up John McAdam. He's the one with the Stick to Wrestling logo for the Avatar. Makes sense, huh? It does. And definitely get on Twitter and follow me before that whole thing burns to the ground. <laughs> I never know what's going on with Twitter day to day. That's that's it's for been sure. a weird, like, six <laughs> weeks on Twitter. <laughs> That's for sure. So, John, I know you said you might not remember the little things that you talked about last episode here on the Regional Wrestling Podcast, but I'm sure you know we did a pretty damn good job of putting a bow on 76, talking everything leading into 77, and we also talked Bruno San Martino's final few months as champion here in 1977. Bruno with five title defenses in MSG in just the first four months of the year, January through April. Three matches against Patera and two with Baron Von Raschke. Yeah, and it looked like everything was smooth sailing and normal, and Bruno would remain champion indefinitely. It, it definitely felt like that to me, and it was shock of all shocks when they made that announcement early May 1977 that he had lost the title to superstar Billy Graham in Baltimore. And there you go. That was it. The date, once again, John reminded us last episode, it was April 30th in Baltimore, Maryland. Superstar Billy Graham captures the WWF World Heavyweight Championship from Bruno San Martino. You know, I have a weird wrestling brain. We are recording this on uh, December 20th, uh, 2022. And yesterday I kind of woke up and started getting my day going. And I was like, oh, December 19th, that was the year in 1979. They had a big Madison Square Garden show in 79. I just remember that because it was. Uh, December 19th, and every April 30th, I'm like, oh, man, it's the anniversary. What was the main event on that show? Oh, the Mass Square Garden show? Yeah. It was uh, Bob Backlund against Bobby Duncan in a really bad and boring Texas death match. Uh, Hulk Hogan made his Madison Square Garden debut okay. against Ted DiBiase. That was, and that was a fun And the stars from New Japan all showed up. Yeah, that's right. That's when they came in. Very cool. Yeah, that's a, that a good little garden show. If you guys ever get bored, you can find that one. Yeah, I believe it's on the network. The the Backlund Duncan match stunk. They, you know, the old WWF they would advertise these no hold barred Texas Death matches, and then you'd have like just a regular wrestling match, guys using headlocks on each other. And we'll uh, talk some Texas Death matches here today on the show because now that Superstar Graham is champion, he's going to have a few himself, and Bruno's going to have a few with Kim Patera we're going to get into later in this episode. But here it is, guys, April 30th. Bruno San Martino was the champion for the first third of the year, and then he says, I'm done to Vince McMahon Sr. I don't want to be champion anymore. Now, it didn't happen this fast, but it happens here. And why Baltimore? Well, according to Superstar Billy Graham, the title switch was done in Baltimore to surprise the fans, so they couldn't predict the venue that the title switches were going to be taking place because... It was becoming pretty obvious to the, the monthly fans at the Garden that, that the championship typically only changed hands there in MSG. And supposedly, according to Graham once again, 
the title switch was done in Baltimore just to throw everyone off that the title can change hands anywhere at any time. Well, I mean, growing up watching WWF wrestling, titles changed hands in three places on television at the Hamburg Arena, Madison Square Garden and the Philadelphia Spectrum. That was it. You know, they did it in Baltimore again, maybe just to throw a curveball at everyone, but they didn't have a title switch anywhere else besides those three venues until 1984, where at the Boston Garden, Tito Santana beat Magnificent Morocco. And I was there, and they lit the place up with cameras right before the match. And we're all going like, there's no way Tito Santana is winning this title. And he did. And we were all very surprised. And again, we had been become conditioned that Boston Garden was not getting any, any title switches. But there it was. Right. And uh, that was another thing Graham pointed out. He said that people probably didn't know walking in that night at, in Baltimore that there was going to be a title switch, but they knew something was up because they brought lighting, they brought cameras. They didn't normally do that in Baltimore. So the fans probably knew something was going on. Something definitely different was about to take place. Now, what that was, I'm sure nobody really anticipated a world title change. Superstar Graham, the new WWF champion, a whole new era with a heel on top here in the company. Yeah, and they had, they advertised it, I think we talked about this, as a battle royal, and the winner gets a shot at Bruno, and, and Graham comes in and says, nah, I just want the title shot. Right. But they put that championship belt on him really, really fast. It wasn't even time for him to have a, a championship match yet. Right, so Graham, now the champion, Bruno's just wanting out of that spot. He doesn't want to have to defend the title uh, monthly, or, or even wrestle monthly anymore here pretty soon. No, uh, someone asked me on Stick to Wrestling, um, sometimes we have mailbag episodes, uh-huh. and what, you know, someone asked me, what if Bruno had Ric Flair-itis? The guy just could not walk away from the game, and my response would have been that Bruno might have held the championship until around 83, 84, because he was still drawing big as the champion. The fans did not seem to be tired of Bruno at all, despite him being the champion for close to 15 years, minus Pedro Morales being champion for a while. So when Graham returned here in 77, he said he was given a winning date, the championship, uh, the date in which he's going to win the title, but also the losing date that he, and he knew he was losing the belt to Bob Backlund in 78 before he even began his run here in 77. Yeah, that's something in my opinion, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. That's something superstar Billy Graham needs to stop talking about. He started talking about it way too much about 25 years ago. Uh-huh. Um, and when I'm, when I say stop talking about it, he was a su- successful champion, and they were drawing at Madison Square Garden, and he's, he's to this day, is asking, why did they make a change? Why are you changing what's working? And there were, there were reasons for it, but, you know, it, it, I think having that 10-month run or whatever, like, he should be happy that he got that. He got something no one else got. Right. And Especially he also needs to just say, you know, Bob Backlund was successful as champion. Yeah, and uh, it's, it is funny. You're right. Every time Graham talks about this, that's what he goes on and on about. But I'll tell you what, I'll give him some credit here for something else, too. He was smart enough to, he knew the switch was coming, and he goes and contacts George Napolitano, for those who don't know, a very famous wrestling photographer, Napolitano, and, and he tells him to please come to the garden. He, he says he came with Napolitano to the garden to make sure that these pictures were taken for the magazines when he wins the belt here. I did not know that, but that's a really interesting story because you're right, normally... The, you know, Napolitano, after et cetera, they would not go just randomly go to Baltimore. Right. Yeah. And that's why, you know, and I've been going through the magazines from that era a lot lately. And there are a lot of pictures from that night from George Napolitano. So I call truth there instead of false, you know, so a lot of wrestlers like to bend, bend the stories a little bit and exaggerate. But in this instance, it seems to be true. There's a lot of pictures out there of the night Graham wins the title. Very smart on his end. Hey, I know I'm winning the belt tonight. I know this is going to go into publications. I'm going to, I mean, really smart way to, to promote himself. Ray, I am so glad you brought that up because the, I think the after mags absolutely knew that superstar Billy Graham was winning the championship. They may not have known what night, but they knew. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember, uh, I believe it was the June 1977 edition of Inside Wrestling where they have a picture of superstar Graham on the cover wrestling Bruno from 1976. And it says, Bruno's belt looks great around my waist. Now, they still had Bruno listed as champion. This had been before, gone to press right. before Graham won the title. But the, the Graham, Graham had been announced as champion on television. So even as a sixth grader, like that kind of you know was a red flag to me. It's like they must have known 
that Graham was winning the belt at some point. Yeah, I'd imagine uh, something of that magnitude, maybe even back in those days, they, they were giving a little heads up, perhaps in advance, just to uh, make sure the publications, mag- they want their stuff out there too, I would imagine, the promoters. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, the after magazines, the wrestling world, which is the Napolitano's magazine, I mean, I think they did a great job selling the promotion's product and per- protecting that product. Yeah, and uh, if you're ready to roll, we can get going, look, kind of look through everything Billy Graham did as champion, at least here in 77. There's a lot of names to go through here. He took oh, on the, totally. he, ran, he ran the gambit, the gauntlet, man. He really did. Yeah, um, there was one thing about Graham's reign that really stood out to me as far as who's, what's missing, who's missing. And to me, to use a Vince McMahonism, conspicuous by his absence why did pedro morales not get a run against superstar billy graham i have always wondered that that's a, that's a good question now morales wasn't in here at the time was he he was down in no Florida, but i, I would have brought him in he was in the no I, I no I, I agree with you i agree with you in fact i think before we get to the end of the year we'll, we'll actually look at a billy graham pedro morales match but it won't take place in new york so it's kind of a it's hidden place in miami i think yes yes it was down down in florida so he does He does wind up working, Pedro, but I get what you say. Why not wrestle the former champion right up here in the big city? It seems like right. a perfect opportunity to bring in Pedro like they did Stasiak the year before. They brought him back at the end of the year, and he's working Bruno, you know, Stasiak, the former champion. Yes, I know nine days, but like you said, they, they sold it on TV like he had hung the moon, in your words. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, I think Morales would have made a lot of sense for a, you know, a two-match series against Superstar Billy Graham going around the horn. I mean, you know, I had no idea until maybe 20 years ago that they had wrestled in Florida. Yeah, and I had no idea until I started doing research. Like, it's just not something I really paid attention to. But I, that's yeah. an excellent point. That's You're right. There's a, a glaring omission there, even though Morales wasn't necessarily in the company at that time, he, he could have been brought in back at any time had they wanted him. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it was a great spot. I mean, you know, he was in the AWA. He was in Florida. But, I mean, that was that was the plum spot. And I've always wondered about that, why they, they didn't bring him in, because I think that would have sold a lot of tickets. We start looking, though, right away, Graham, uh, on TV. And, and I should know, for several weeks in a row, they would air this title switch. Just in case you missed it last week, they're going to make sure you see this title change here from Baltimore, Graham going over on Bruno San Martino. So everybody, by the end of May at least, should know that Billy Graham is the champion up in the New York territory. But his very first match in the Garden, MSG, as champion, was against Gorilla Monsoon in May. And I, I'm not positive. I don't believe that was a title defense. I believe it was on the line. And okay. what they did in the WWF was, if the titles changed hands, the new champion uh, would, ju- would just wrestle whoever he was scheduled to wrestle, but it was a t- now a title match. I specifically remember they had uh, Bruno San Martino versus George Steele scheduled in Boston, and, th- and then in the undercard, superstar Billy Graham against Tony Gurria, and they got on TV, and they would be like, Tony Gurria has the opportunity of a lifetime. He's the luckiest man in the world. He now has a championship match against superstar Billy Graham, and they, they did the same thing with Bob Backlund, after he won the title, I think he was wrestling Toru Tanaka in Boston, and it was a title match. Okay. Very cool. Sorry, guys. I uh, got hey, some of no, my, my I... research wrong there. I appreciate you correcting me, though. I need to no, get this, I mean, these I... things. I need all the facts for the for everybody listening. Yeah, the NWA did it way differently. Uh, you know, in, instead of Harley Race coming to town against the Von Erichs or Dusty Rhodes, whoever, Ric Flair is now coming to town. And right. the WWF, they just kept the matches the same, just different champion. Right. I gotcha. So he wins the title from Bruno. A few weeks later, he's beating Gorilla Monsoon in MSG, and it goes on from there. Throughout the summer, he returns in June, and Bruno gets his title rematch against Superstar Graham in MSG here. Standing before a capacity crowd here in Madison Square Garden, a controversial worldwide wrestling federation champion, Mr. Graham. 20-some-odd thousand people are here to see 27, you. 27,000, Billy Jr. 27,000 people, to be exact. And 27,000 people on the sidewalk that could not get in to see this match. Bruno San Martino cannot get the belt back from Superstar Billy Graham. I am the champion. I am the greatest. I am the strongest. This is my belt. I got the proof, baby. I'm the man of power, the man with the power. Too sweet to be sour. There are those fans in Los Angeles and St. Louis and Florida all over waiting for your appearance. Do you think 
Well, again, here you see Superstar exposing that tremendous physique, the most impressive physique in all of professional wrestling. This is the body of a champion. This is the strength of a champion. This is the beauty of a champion. This is the brains of a champion. Look, look, look. There it is, Superstar Billy oh, Graham. The greatest. The greatest. They go to a double disqualification. There is no MSG in July, but then they come back in August, August 1st, with Bruno scoring a win over Graham, although due to the too much blood, blood loss once again. This is actually winds up being Bruno San Martino's final title shot in MSG here against Superstar Graham. The 22, perhaps 23-inch bicep of Superstar Billy Graham. And Graham has made the comment before the broadcast this week that he will challenge Bruno San Martino again as Gorilla Monsoon will evidence the uh, guest referee capacity. But according to Graham, and we'd like to ask you if you repeat that publicly, you intend to challenge Bruno once again as far as strength is concerned and otherwise contemplate a scientific match, his return match. Maybe not too scientific as far as collegiate wrestling style goes, but I'm talking about a power confrontation. The man is indeed powerful. The man is indeed strong. The man has indeed got brute strength. Now I, I will defend my title. I will retain my title on these grounds, on the grounds of power, on the grounds of strength. I will show the capacity crowd that is predicted for Madison Square Garden and around the world that I am indeed stronger than Bruno San Martino. I will arm wrestle the man if I have to. I will bench press the man if I have to. But most of all, I will retain the solid plate gold. And you notice Bruno did not do the honors on the way out, and which is fine with me. I think I don't think the fans in New York wanted him wanted him to see him lose. The final match had Gorilla Monsoon as the guest referee, and it went to a a, a kind of a no finish, double disqualification, I think, right. or a double blood stop. And the next month it was Ivan Putski. But taking a step back, Ray, you told you said that they they aired footage of the title change, you know, mm-hmm. a couple of times in every market, and. They didn't just air the title change. They aired that superstar Billy Graham cheated to win the title by using, right. using both feet, feet on the ropes on the rope. as leverage, and the referee mm-hmm. didn't see it. But, I mean, Bruno, you know, they're, they're kind of trying to me- send the message. Bruno got screwed. He'll beat superstar Billy Graham next time around. Yeah, and I, th- I think that was a great idea. Booking-wise, even if Bruno said, yeah, I'll do the job on the way out, no problem. I don't see Bruno necessarily saying that. And as a fan, I, don't, I wouldn't want to see that anyway. But I, I think from a booking standpoint, I love that they left it open-ended because you never know when Bruno might have changed his mind and we could have slid him back in there maybe, you know, he, he never really knows. So I love that he didn't really, Bruno didn't have to put him over in MSG as uh, San Martino steps aside here after August as far as uh, going after the, the title. Right, ex- exactly. And I don't, I don't think he did a real job in any of the WWF cities. I know the uh, the Saturday before Graham lost the title. They did a, a cage match, and they did the old thing where Bruno hits Graham so hard he goes flying out the cage door. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, you know, they had finishes like that, but they never had uh, Graham pin Bruno again. So there was no MSG show in July. They open up August though with that match between Bruno scoring a win over Graham, albeit on a technicality there. But we fast forward to the end of August. They return August 29th. This time, as you just pointed out. Graham takes on one of his many challengers multiple times over the course of the next several months, Polish power Ivan Putski. To my left, ladies and gentlemen, the reigning worldwide wrestling federation heavyweight champion superstar Billy Graham. Before another capacity crowd here in Madison Square Garden, there are those here who certainly are in your favor, those who are not, Mr. Graham. Some are booing, some are cheering, but nevertheless, there's pandemonium tonight. There's excitement. Look at the people's faces. Look at the people's expressions. Can you feel it? Look at you. You're excited because I am the champion, the worldwide wrestling federation champion. How can I retain this belt? Why am I still the champion after months and months and months? Because I'm in shape. I'm powerful. I'm strong. I wake up every morning. Every morning. Work out for five hours. Run 19 miles a day. Swim across the Atlantic Ocean. Unbelievable condition. I am the man of the hour. The man with the power. Too sweet to be sour. Mystery excitement. Look at the pandemonium. Look at the thousands of people. Thousands of people. All Will you defend your championship in other areas here in the United States? Anywhere in the world. Japan, Australia, United States, California. 
Mexico, I don't care, Central America, any state, any city, anywhere, that man is from Japan, all even dependent in Japan, anywhere Thank you, you want. Thank you very much for your time, superstar Billy Graham. I have seen that match, I actually saw that match recently, and to say that superstar Billy Graham and Ivan Putski had the crowd in the palm of their hand is an absolute understatement. Absolutely. And Putsky was over like crazy. Unbelievable. At the beginning of the match, I know what you're, I know which match you're referencing. Uh, the crowd is just shaking the garden with, with these, these guys just bumping chests. They're, they're colliding in tackles. Nobody's going anywhere. Finally, Putsky looks like he delivers that Polish hammer early on there. Yes. And, and Graham takes that, I don't want to call it Kurt Hennig ass because he doesn't go flying up in the air, but he, Takes that kind of back roll bump with his feet hanging on the ropes. The crowd, there isn't anybody sitting down. That They're shaking the entire building. It was just amazing what kind of crowds we had back then. People were screaming and jumping up and down. It was amazing. Yeah, really good stuff there. Unfortunately, Putski doesn't get the win there. Graham scoring the, the win, but only on a count out. So Putski lives to fight another day. Doesn't do the job just yet. No, not not this time. Um, but, Ray, I'll tell you what, I I can see the crowd going into Madison Square Garden thinking that they were going to see a title switch. Uh, the last two heels that held the titles, um, Stan Stasiak and Ivan Koloff, had very short reigns. And I could see a fan thinking, OK, they're just transitioning from Bruno to Putski. And a lot of people might disagree with me. I think Ivan Putski would have sold tickets as WWF world champion, at least for a little while. Yeah, unfortunately, most of the people that know Ivan Putsky, they know him from the 80s. And that's, yeah. you know, that's the tail end of his, his real career there. I know he held the tag titles with Tito Santana, but, you know, uh, he just became extremely muscle bound, got a lot older, didn't have to do a whole lot. Almost in that George Steele role where you're more of a gimmick now, not like George Steele, but I mean, where you really don't have to bump, you don't have to sell, you're coming out there really to wave and do a couple of your big spots. You're, you're a muscle man, really, is what Ivan Putsky was in the Jesse Ventura feud and, and things like that. I have a good friend, Tyler Judd, who grew up on Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, and he explained to me that Jimmy Valiant was a very valuable piece in that puzzle, in that they could send Jim, Jimmy Valiant into a small town in the woods in North Carolina, Virginia, wherever, and the, and the place would sell out or come close to it because he had that kind of charisma. Ivan Putsky was kind of our Jimmy Valiant, was not a good worker, but the the fans loved him. When he came and main evented against Ray Stevens right here in Nashua for almost 40 years ago today against uh, against Ray Stevens, the place was close to sold out. Ivan Putski's coming to town. Let's buy tickets. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's no denying it. If, if anybody wants to question how over Putski was, go back and watch the match we were just talking about, Graham and Putski. Watch the first five minutes. Uh, it's, it was it, insane. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it's on Peacock, but... I mean, go out there and look for it. I, I saw it on Twitter, I think, last week. I mean, it was nuts. Oh, yeah. So Graham is starting to work his way through a lot of the familiar talent in the company. He's beat Bruno. Gorilla's already been there. Putski, obviously. And now he runs into sort of a new talent. We, we saw him come in, work a couple MSG shows back in March. And then we see some TV matches from Florida. But now he has a Rob, baby. I can dream. Doth the road coming in here in Pullock, if you will. In Pullock, if you will. Absolutely. You know, uh, Chief J. Strongbow got two matches against Superstar Billy Graham at the Boston Garden. To this day, I'm very surprised he didn't he didn't get one match at Madison Square Garden against uh, Graham. He got one uh, up in Long Island, but he never got one at Madison Square Garden. And to this day, that surprises me a little bit because Strongbow, again, he's one of the, these guys that a lot of people who didn't grow up around here just never saw his appeal. And I get that. But he was over like crazy. And I, like I said, I'm surprised he didn't get that that moment in the sun at Madison Square Garden. Oh, yeah. There were absolutely times where Strongbow was the number two, I'd say, underneath uh, underneath like Bruno or whatever. You had to get through Strongbow to get to Bruno. And in some instances where you didn't walk right in and get the title defense, sometimes you had that feud with Strongbow. Or sometimes you worked your way down from Bruno to Strongbow. Yeah, that's, you, and, you know, I mean, Strongbow, how over was he? He main evented Madison Square Garden more than once, teaming up against Bruno against the Valiants. Right. Yeah, Strongbow had some great angles there. Jimmy Valiant turned heel, wasn't it? Was, was, am, I, am I not wrong in, in remembering that? Valiant turned heel on Strongbow early on when, when Valiant first came in? 
for not when he first came in, but yeah, Strongbow was the guy he turned on. Every, every, Strongbow was like the guy everyone turned on. Well, Bruno didn't get, he wasn't so lucky either. He had a few, few detractors, but yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. It was a, it was an easy go-to in the, the New York uh, market. Whoever you wanted him to feel, which seven turn on you, and there we go. <laughs> it worked. It worked with, with, with uh, Arion. It worked oh with Oh my Valiant. God, did it worked with Arion. It kind of worked with my Via. I don't know that I saw any more heat than, than the uh, Bruno Arion matches. Those were oh, uh, off the hook. They really were. I mean, Bruno was so beloved in the Northeast. And Arion, you know, he just reminded me of this, like, nasty Greek neighbor you, you'd, you'd have as a, a in, living in your apartment. <laughs> I can see that. That you avoided. <laughs> I can see that. The guy that doesn't talk to you on the elevator. Yeah, yeah. just, you know, hey, how you doing? He's <laughs> uh, yeah, Absolutely. I can see that. Absolutely. So we're moving into the fall now, and Dusty Rhodes comes in for the first time. I don't want to say full time, but he's in more now than he was any time prior to this. And he gets a couple of guard matches here against Superstar for the belt. In September, Dusty wins a match on the countout. They do the return match in October. This time, it's Superstar Graham going over on the Mac and Dream in a Texas death match here. The two colliding, Graham falling on top, scoring the win over Dusty Rhodes there. Now, we know we won't be able to talk about this here on 1977, John, but they have that return match when Graham's no longer champion in 78, uh, a very famous bull rope match. Right now, we did indeed make reference to the ranked number one contender earlier. Let's bring on the son of a plumber. Let's bring on a man whose dream appears to unquestionably be on the, the proper path to come true. I just was uh, rapping before I come up here to probably one of the greatest athletes in our country today, Bob Backlund. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, if they got a good defense, he said, you got to counter it with a good offense. And it's very true because the American dream is offensive there. You know, I'm, I'm minded that way. I'm geared to offense, you understand? I'm geared to moving. I'm geared to jabbing. I'm geared to moving. I'm geared to takedown. I'm geared to taking superstars Billy, Billy Graham's big 22-inch arm in my hands and ripping up on it. And he'd be talking about, I was hurt. You know what was hurt about superstar Billy Graham? His feelings were hurt. His feelings were hurt because when he went home, he is, he is whoever he was with say, boy, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for letting that man jump on you like that and then it beat you after death. The weasel went out and got loaded on milk and everything. It was so messed up, he didn't know where it was going or what it was doing. The whole town was electrified. It's going to happen. Superstar Graham will find the end of a rainbow. The dream will win. I mean, clearly, even in 78, I saw this, that they're kind of just giving Dusty his win back. Like, so he could say, okay, I, I won the feud with, with superstar Billy Graham. I saw the first match where Dusty wins on countout, and he's jumping up and down with the belt like he knows he's champion. I just remember being like, you know, is he kidding me? How many times did he beat Harley Race <laughs> by countout and didn't win the belt, but he hasn't figured out the rules? Okay. Yeah, and uh, we get that you know infamous announcement that even though Dusty Rhodes has won the title or won won the match, the title doesn't change hands on a count out. And somehow, a lot of the times, the fans didn't figure that out until after the fact, even though they should have known as well. Because you get that big loud boo sometimes. Yeah, I think I was very surprised that even twenty percent of the audience thought that the title changed hands. I mean, we've seen Bruno lose matches on count out, and the title didn't change hands. So you know, right. how much of a newcomer can you be? But I will say this. In 1977, Superstar Billy Graham and Dusty Rhodes was a dream match. Even though they'd done it before in Florida, they'd done it before in the AWA, these were both guys at their peak. It was the number one heel in the sport against the number one babyface in the sport. So s some of these names, you don't really need a backstory, although Bruno didn't need a backstory. He had one in being the former champion. He was coming back to uh, regain what was rightfully his. He was, it was stolen from him. As you pointed out, the match was played on TV every, so everybody could see that Graham had his feet on the ropes. Dusty Rhodes comes in. It's Dusty Rhodes. People aren't going to question why Dusty's getting a title shot anyway, just listening to those promos heading into the match, I'm sure. But in this instance, as we move into November, Billy Graham against High Chief Peter Maivia, and maybe they felt they needed a little oomph going into this one. So they give this a little play on TV. There's an angle involved where Billy Graham actually breaks the famous ukulele of one High Chief Peter Maivia. Continuing to hammer my idea. My idea has 
you can say is cut. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Maivia, as he exists at this moment, and Peter, I suspect that when you clash with superstar Billy Graham, I believe the fans in Madison Square Garden will see a match the likes of which they've never seen before. You know something, Vince? Look at this. This is what is left over of what that man did to me and to this. This is the pride of my people, my pride, my family's pride. And yet this man has insulted me and my people and my island by breaking this over my head. And I still have blood in it. See that? I've let my people down. I've let so many people down because this was a, a present when I left home and they presented it to me and I've carried it ever since. And look what is happening to it. Ever since this has happened, I have never taken that man out of my mind day and night. I look at myself in the mirror in the morning and all I see is this, the face of this man. Graham, you have gone long enough. You have insulted me long enough. You have insulted the intelligence of my people. You have insulted my island. Now you're going to face. The reigning Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion, unquestionably, look at that arm bordering on 22, perhaps 23 inches in circumference. Superstar Billy Graham with the most impressive physique in professional wrestling today. However, Mr. Graham, I hasten to add, it is not your physique, it is not your power that's on the line, but rather the championship. And this is professional wrestling and your opponent, the paramount Chief Peter Maivia, the individual whom uh, you just humiliated uh, not too long ago. It was a, a despicable thing uh, to see a champion do. I had to put the man in his place. I had to put Chief Peter Maivia in his place. You're nothing but a, but a boy. You're nothing but a Samoan peasant. That's all you are, nothing but a beggar. You don't belong in Madison Square Garden. I admit. I'm going to go on record right here in a minute because it's the truth. The man is undefeated, has beaten everybody he has faced in Madison Square Garden. But nevertheless, you are still a peasant in the eyes of superstar Billy Graham. And I will give you the lesson, the wrestling lesson of your life. I'm going to give you the fist fight lesson of your life. By the way, I know you eat a lot of coconuts in Hawaii, but if you ever ate a knuckle sandwich, how huh, was it? You're going to get more than that, but you're never going to take this belt back to Samoa. When the uh, superstar finishes with you, you'll be on the corner of 42nd and Broadway with a little tin cup playing that ukulele of yours going for coins because you're a fourth-rate wrestler, a fifth-rate musician, and an eighth-rate cannibal. They did a bunch of TVs where, Super, where Peter Maivia would come to the ring, and he was still relatively new to the WWF. He had gotten here, I want to say, right before uh, Graham won the title. And he would get on the mic, and he'd play his ukulele and sing, and he'd be like, you know, the happy-go-lucky <laughs> right. Samoan chief Peter Maivia. And they did the angle where Graham comes in, and he breaks the ukulele over uh, Maivia's head, which... I believe was the <laughs> only time they did an angle to put some heat on a match uh, during Graham's reign. And it didn't work. Well, it worked in that, you know, they, they drew a decent crowd, but it was the only time superstar Billy Graham defended the title at Madison Square Garden and it did not sell out. And, you know, I, I keep using this expression, even as a little kid, I realized that they needed to put a little, you know, a little salt and pepper on this because, my Via versus Graham going in cold just wasn't going to sell tickets or, or draw interest. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Graham's talked about this match, too, and, and he had nothing bad at all to say about Peter Maivia. But going in, he said he was told by Vince McMahon, the promoter, that this match was not going to sell the garden out. He Nobody was going to believe that a tattooed up uh, Simone was going to win the title. That was supposedly Vince Sr.'s uh, words to Graham. So they decided we needed a little, little something, put a little something on this. And, and do what we can to try to sell the garden out. And that's sp supposedly why this angle was ran, to give it just a little more heat. And, and that makes sense. I mean, when, whenever uh, Backland had kind of a, you know, lukewarm challenger, they do the exact same thing. They had uh, Bob Backlund, uh, Bulldog Brower scheduled in 1979, and they did an angle where Brower attacked uh, Backlund on TV. And, okay, now we get to see Bob Backlund get revenge as opposed to uh, just defend the title. And, again, you could see we, we've got kind of a weak challenger. We need to do something. Peter Maivia, the Samoan chief, squaring off against superstar Billy Graham. 
There's no such word for Vince as squaring off. Because I'm going to prove to Graham, I'm going to prove to the people in New York, I'm going to prove to the world that I'm going to chew you, you call me as a, as a cannibal. Well, you're going to see how cannibal I am, Mr. Graham, because I'm going to chew you from the top to the bottom. Brief words of Peter Maivia, ladies and gentlemen, as a result of what happened last week. I'll tell you one thing, he has a believer here. Peter Maivia, perhaps resorting to cannibalism or what have you, it's going to be some confrontation against superstar Billy Graham. If we may, let's bring on superstar Billy Graham at this moment. And Mr. Graham, now that Peter Maivia is clearly back into the dressing room and out of the way, let's speak of, have you in your life, ever dreamed that you would face such a man? I've never seen a man out of control, unleashed. The savage is loose, Peter Maiva. The savage is loose. The cannibal is loose. The man's pride, his dignity, his heritage, his family, his people, his island, himself has been insulted. Now, this belt, the man says he doesn't even care about. All he wants is my body. All he wants is sweet revenge. All he wants is to get his manhood and his pride back. Maiva, you got tattoos all over your body. The only place you ain't got a tattoo is on your face. And I'm going to give you some new tattoos, superstar Billy Graham. I'm not the heavyweight champion of the world by chance, not by accident, not by a stroke of fate, not by luck, because I am the greatest. I am the strongest. I'm the man the hour, the man with the power, too sweet to be sour, wizard. Everything we said about you, my V, is absolutely true. You are a cannibal, you are psycho, but you will never take this belt to Samoa. This belt shall remain with the one, the only, the incomparable superstar Billy Graham. You'll never, never have this in Samoa. This belongs to us, and we shall keep it. And then we close out the year as far as MSG goes in December. Superstar Graham coming in to defend the title against Mil Mascaras, which is a very odd challenger by my estimation. But very interestingly, Bob Backlund accompanies Mascaras to not just this match, but they have a rematch in January as well. But here in December, it's Mascaras going over on the Superstar once again due to the blood loss decision. Well, Mestris can tell you what he's going to do, but the superstar, the champion, the man you see before you right now, has his own personal score to settle. Do you think the superstar likes what he's seeing right now? The answer is no, and if you want to know what the champion, the man who owns this belt, is going to do, ask him, McMahon. Ask Graham. him about the offensive. <laughs> offensive tactics. I'm going to come out of the locker room. Fighting. I'm not even going to listen to the rules. I know the rules of New York City. I know the rules of Madison Square Garden. All I'm going to do is come out as hard and as fast as I can. I'm going to go ahead and admit and give credit where credit is due. Mill Masters has got more moves than a bowl of jello. Superstar Billy Graham is going to come out and I'm going to put it on you. I'm going to come down with a 22 inch arm. Take a look at this arm. The arm of the world champion. The arm of the world champion. Let's go be around your head. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring on the ranked number one challenger in the wrestling world today. Let's bring on the international wrestling star, Mil Mascaris. Mr. Mascaris, opposing superstar Billy Graham. Everyone looking forward to this, uh, as well, everyone perhaps except the superstar himself. Well, I'm ready. I'm in the best condition, the best shape. I have the very special tactics for this Monday match. Well, that's one of the key, not to interrupt you, Mill, but that's one of the key elements, I think, that, uh, that has placed you among the top of, of wrestlers of all time, I believe, is the, your ability uh, to fluctuate w with not only uh, uh, styles and what have you, but uh, holds and everything else. You, your opponent never really knows what you're going to do. Well, I train in regular two hours, hour and a half, you know. This time I train four hours, four hours because I need better shape, better condition. And I promise all you fans can and give me big moral support and I'm going to beat him again in the middle of the ring. Mill Mascaris, ladies and gentlemen, opposing superstar Billy Graham. Mr. Mascaris confident that on this occasion, not only will he defeat superstar as he did in a previous contest, but he'll walk from the ring, crown the new champion. If we may, let's bring on now the Grand Wizard of Wrestling along with the reigning superstar Billy Graham. McMahon! The masked Mexican bandit is never going to wear this championship belt. I'm I, in shape. That's right. I'm in shape. I've been living and sleeping, eating and traveling in my sweatsuit. I'm ready. 
I'm a bit so aggressive. I'm so keyed up. I'm so psyched up. Superstar Billy Graham, the man of how the man with the power is going to retain. Retention is the word. Retention of the heavyweight champion. Superstar Billy Graham. So Masker is scoring a, a win of sorts over Graham heading into the new year. But what's interesting is they're really building to something completely different. Even though we're watching uh, a double shot of Graham and Mascaris in December and January, it's all leading to the Backlund match in February, the title change. Yeah, they they built that up. And Mascaris against Graham, I, you know, I just used the term dream match with Dusty Rhodes. That was also a dream match. I mean, you had the, the colorful, high-flying Mil Mascaris against superstar Billy Graham. Both matches sold out. Ray, I'm going to say something that, you know, mm-hmm. I, I've said it on Stick to Wrestling, but I'll say it here. Yeah. Right now, December 2022, Mil Moskers is the most underrated wrestler of all time, in my opinion. He has gotten so much heat uh, from the stuff Superstar Billy Graham has said about him. And, you know, that's just kind of snowballed over the years. If you stop and watch Mil Moskers wrestle... He has some really good matches out there, and his tag team with Dos Caras, I mean, they were like the Midnight Express in Japan. So I, I think Mascaris gets a lot of, of unfair heat. I think there was a point where he was overrated because, you know, Bill Opter loved him and, and said, not, you know, put him on the cover of the magazines and right. heaped a lot of high praise on him. But, you know, those days are long over, and he was really – he was a great wrestler. And we're talking – Post prime Neil Moskers, supposedly he was a lot better in the late sixties and early seventies. Right. What little footage is out there of Mill going back to the early seventies? It's it's night and day. Even I'll go so far as to say, if you guys can watch early seventies Pedro Morales, he's pretty impressive himself. And I'm not trying to compare the two two completely different workers, but I've seen just a little of Mill. What's out there, and he's night and day from the Mill Mascaris that other people might have seen in the. Late eighties, they would come in and did a did a did a match at World Class, or he came in and worked the Clash of the Champions, or things like that, or even in the WWF in the late nineties. But just a completely different guy, uh, amazing in the ring. I, I agree with you, very hell of a talent. But years and years of burial by Superstar Graham, by Bruce Pritchard, by uh, Cactus Jack Mick Foley, guys like that that had bad experiences with him, shared their experiences, and it's just lingered. Yeah, uh, Graham tells the story. I heard this uh, on Wrestling Observer Live like 22, 23 years ago. Uh, Dave had Superstar Billy Graham on, and Graham said that, you know, Mil Moskers absolutely refused to do the honors at Madison Square Garden, and they came up with a, a weak finish where Bob Backlund got involved. Mm-hmm. And Graham said that Moskers just came in with a really bad attitude and sandbagged that entire match. Now, I have not seen the match. It is, as far as I know, it's not available. But, you know, I mean, that, that's his side of the story. I mean, you know, once again, not to be disrespectful towards Graham, but, you know, Graham has told some stories over the years that kind of, you know, made me raise my eyebrow a little bit. So, yeah, that, you know, listening to Graham, like I, I when I was doing research, one of the things I did was quickly go through the timeline Sean Oliver did with Billy Graham on the 77, 78 title run. But knowing the superstar and I'm not trying to, you know crap on anybody here but knowing the superstar and some of the tales that have been told over the years and his back and forth love hate relationship with Vince McMahon whichever side of the paycheck he's on I right. have I have to fact check everything he says so even though he's telling me some interesting things here every single thing he told me I had to jot it down and then fact check it I I had to make sure that I could prove this was correct before you know I brought it on air here now ladies and gentlemen let's bring on the ranked number one contender in the worldwide wrestling federation today the international wrestling star Mil Mascaris. Mil Mascaris would unquestionably not only the body to rival that of superstar Billy Graham, but perhaps superseding his abilities in many, many categories. Mr. Mascaris, if you please, against superstar Graham, we've seen you in Madison Square Garden. You're undefeated all over the world. And against the superstar, he may try to overpower you. Well, I'm ready for the championship match. I'm promised very, very, very good match. Because he's a strong, he's a big man, you know, and thin little strong. I make very good action. I promise all you fans, one of the best matches you'll never see. It will be a good match. There's no question about it. All the ingredients here, there. You take that massive bulk of Graham. Take your tremendous physique in its own right. And there's a lot of power, a lot of agility. And then the moves, the likes of which we've never seen before, that you possess in Madison Square Garden and recently... On the ropes, flying off, and we've never seen anybody move like that, and I don't think Graham has either, and considering that, you may have an advantage. 
Well, I think I go use different techniques, different tactics this time, you know. This, this is a special occasion for me, you know. And I'm, No question of that. I'm wearing my special secrets for this time, for championship match. So we can look for some different techniques then in Madison Square Garden against Superstar. Yes, sir. I don't like to talk too much, you know. But what I don't say, I'm waiting for him in the middle of the ring. And I promise, very, very good match. Mill Mascaris, ladies and gentlemen, opposing superstar Billy Graham on that, unquestionably, we said before, has the ingredients of making of one of the greatest wrestling matches held in Madison Square Gardens. And we may briefly, let's bring on the champion, superstar Graham with the Grand Wizard. Always run out of town. We know this man is a movie star. Famous movie star in Mexico, South America, Puerto Rico, all around the world. But there's another movie you're in, in Madison Square Garden. There's another acting. There's no movie career. As a matter of fact, your movie career will be over when I expose your face and all your fans around the world see the pimples on your face, the acne on your face, the barracles veins in your eyes, how bloodshot you And the ladies, this man is ugly. He's not the handsome Latin that he's supposed to be. I'm going to retain my belt, superstar belt. Billy Graham is the greatest and the strongest, and Masters will find out firsthand. I mean, I saw that timeline with Sean Oliver, who is a great interviewer, by the way, um, with superstar Billy Graham. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to make fun, but, you know, superstar Billy Graham, he seems a, a bit emotionally unstable. And when I say that, he started sobbing, literally sobbing in the middle of that interview, recalling some story where they're in the car and Baron McKell is cold mm -hmm. and he gives him a coat and it's like he's sobbing over this yeah <laughs> anyway I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking at my bookshelf and I did this on purpose I have Bob Backlund and superstar Billy Graham's autobiographies right next to each other because I, I because of all this stuff Graham says about Backlund I just did that for the hell of it he does say you know there's a, quite a bit of that there in the middle of that uh, timeline Graham kind of sh basically shitting on Backlund but not really crapping on him as a human being just as a wrestler he had no business uh, being champion well yeah i mean he talks about you know this alleged meeting where he had with dusty Rhodes and vince mcmahon senior where vince mcmahon senior says guys can you teach bob backland a little charisma can you not have him go <laughs> into the ring with a bathrobe well where the championship is underneath it and it's like you know again if, if backland had failed as champion if he had been a disappointment as champion i could see some of it but at the end of the day superstar the wwf was wildly spectacularly successful with bob backland as their world world's heavyweight champion right and had they not been i'm pretty sure this being you know a gimmicked work here they they could have just taken the belt off of him, right? I mean, so. they, they could have just gone in another direction. Exactly. My understanding is in some of the other, you know, not that he was successful right away in Madison Square Garden. It took a little while in Boston. It took a little while in Pittsburgh, but he got there eventually. Yeah, it just it kills me <laughs> when everybody wants to bury Bob Backlund. And by the 80s, as I, I followed his run, I started, you know, it's it could have been anybody. I don't know if it would have been Bruno, but it could have been pretty much anybody else where I would have said, eh, I've seen this long enough, time to let's let's do something else. But I can't argue that it was successful to the point where there's nobody, there's no promoter that's going to push somebody on top as champion for over five years unless they're bringing in revenue. It's just you, you wouldn't exist anymore. Your company would be out of business. Exactly. I mean, and that's something, you know, and not to pile on superstar Billy Graham, but at some point he has to acknowledge that, you know, Bob Backlund winning the championship was a successful formula for the World Wrestling Federation. Right. So we talked about this in the last episode, too, with Bruno. He was wrestling certain guys in the garden in certain months. And then the follow up months, that's when he would work those same guys in the other cities like Boston and Philadelphia. This is a little bit different here with Graham because Graham is working Dusty Rhodes and Bruno and things like that at MSG. But he's working other tier, if you want to call them a tier of talent in some of the other cities. Uh, look here at uh, Boston. After winning the title, some of Graham's opponents included for the remainder of the year. Tony Gurria, Larry Zabisco. He did a two-match uh, deal with uh, Chief J. Strongbow, ending in a cage match. Graham going over there. And then they return that and do it two more matches, this time Graham and Putzky to close the year in Boston. And they also end in a cage match. I remember they they're them pushing the Larry Zabisco title switch very hard as this is you know, this is practically Bruno's son. It's Bruno's protege. It's little Bruno. 
and you know, and Larry, they they pushed that storyline very hard. That you know, that's who Larry Zabisco was. And you know, I see Larry Zabisco. He got a title match in uh, uh, up in Long Island in Uniondale. Uh, Billy White Wolf got a title match there. Uh, Gorilla Monsoon. You're right. Kind of the B team went to Long Island. The A team was Madison Square Garden. Boston uh, was somewhere kind of in between. I, I've I've always I've always said that, you know, Boston Guard was not Madison Square Guard when it came to wrestling. No, right. And, and it's like you pointed out that he did, uh, Graham, pronouns, pal, right? So Graham didn't get to work Strongbow in MSG, but he does work him here twice in Boston. That could have easily been a match in Madison Square Garden as well. So I wouldn't necessarily, I, I get what you're saying. And, and it is like the high end B team. It is the, it is technically the B team main eventers, Strongbow, Pusky. These are guys you would throw on that B show and still know you're going to sell out. Yes, exactly. And you know what? We talked about my via, you know, clearly not being a strong challenger at Madison Square Garden. I've always wondered why they didn't just put Strongbow in that spot. Yeah, good call. I, maybe they were trying something different. It's the only thing I could come up with. But I agree with you. It could have been Strongbow easily in that in that November spot over uh, my via. I mean, Strongbow was, was so over in the WWF. To, to give you an idea, the day Strongbow died, uh, I, heard, I, I saw it on the internet that he'd passed away. But then driving home... They were talking about it on the radio that Chief J Strongbow had passed away. I mean, yes. that. I mean, I don't remember. I, I, maybe they did, but when Bruno passed away, I don't remember even that being talked about as much as Strongbow. And so, so much like Boston, Graham works some of the same talent in Philadelphia as well in a different order. He works Strongbow again, Garia, Zabisco, but he also near the end of the year at the Spectrum. It's Graham and Bruno, so we're getting the rematches finally with Bruno San Martino here that go into 78, February 78, briefly before Graham drops the belt to Bob Backlund. Graham is wrestling Bruno San Martino in a steel cage here in Philadelphia. Yes, and that is widely available on video. Um, it was a, it was a good match. Um, it wasn't you know high spot mania, but it was a good match. They had the the referee Dick Worley m- mic'd up so you could hear the guys talking to each other. And you know, two days later, uh, Bob Backlund wins the WWF Championship from Super Superstar Billy Graham. My understanding is that, and yeah, I'm I know we're in '78. I apologize for that but that everyone at Madison Square Garden basically knew the title was changing hands. Like, everyone had either heard about it or figured it out, but they were expecting a title change. So Graham is really just, he's taking on the world here (laughs) as far as uh, 1977 goes. I mean, they go to Baltimore, and obviously Graham beats Bruno in Baltimore, so you got to do a return match there, and they do. It's Bruno and Graham going to a double DQ, and then we never see the match again in Baltimore, but they just continue to run the gambit there, in the Baltimore area, Graham over Bobo Brazil, Strongbow. And then they do a fun little two-show angle in October, November of 77. It's uh, Graham versus Putsky with Larry Zabisco as the referee. And Zabisco stops the match due to blood loss on Graham. And that upsets Graham, who attacks Zabisco post-match, which leads to the December Baltimore show, Graham over Zabisco. So tell a little story there in Baltimore. I mean, that totally makes sense. You know, we got Bruno, Sam, excuse me, Superstar Billy Graham against Tony Gurria up here in Boston, and it was because the title had switched hands. Like, I don't see how there was any other way, really, Gurria could have gotten a, a – had been a credible challenger in another city. Like, if they just in, – in summer of 77, if they just said, okay, you know, Superstar Billy Graham against the number, the number one contender, Tony Gurria – I got a question that promote. I got a question that promoting, quite frankly. <laughs> right. Ab- absolutely. And then we, we look at another. We talked about MSG. Let's talk about Nassau. So a- another slew of challengers here. Some interesting names in this instance. This might be the only time I, I came up with this, at least in a, in a real a big. I hate to say real city, John, but a big, a bigger city, if you will. And it's a Graham over Billy White Wolf. So White Wolf even gets a title defense here, as does Haystacks Calhoun. Oh, Graham's right. going to win. And that, this is the fun story. Graham's told this story. I've heard a couple people online that they claim they went to the show and saw this happen. It was uh, Graham. Apparently, he had went to Vince Sr. prior to the show and said, why am I in this match? We're not going to have any, any kind of a match out there. And so the story goes, Haystacks goes over to his corner, takes off his lucky horseshoe, goes to hang it around the ring post. Graham attacks him from behind, beats him down. Haystacks goes through the ropes to the outside and eats a count out in, in something like 30 seconds. So not much of a title defense. No. And I mean, I, I think res- wrestling fans, you know, when I was 
younger and I would go to see the, you know, the Boston Garden shows with Bob Backlin on top, we all had an agreement that we would turn off our brains, that we knew that everything was predetermined, worked, et cetera. Um, but, you know, at some point you have, you have to be like, OK, that's my main event, 30 seconds. And I get it. By that point, Haystack's Calhoun had way slowed down. And it's not like he was Sayama in the first place. So, you know, but I mean, why? Why I, I've always said this. Why schedule a match if you can't figure out a finish for that match? Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, back yourself or, into a or, corner. Or, you know, and promoters have done there, that since like, the beginning of time. Doing this? Yes, yes, you're right. I, I can't wait to see this. I can't wait to see how they get out of this one. And then it <laughs> becomes clear that they didn't know how they were going to get out of this one either. So, <laughs> you know, another guy you mentioned, Billy White Wolf. I mean, mm-hmm. he was he certainly was not a a main event caliber wrestler. Like you know, no one no. was. Buying into the idea that he was going to win the championship from superstar Billy Graham. Right. On the other hand, I mean, how many times did I go? I, I went to the Boston Garden show every time they had one when Backlund was champion. And I knew full well that Killer Khan wasn't winning the WWF championship. I knew full well, as great as he was in the ring, that Adrian Adonis was not going to be WWF champion. Right. But you went because you enjoyed it. That's an excellent, <laughs> excellent point of view. I mean, there were many times I went to shows, and I knew Hulk Hogan wasn't going to lose the title, and I was never a Hulk Hogan fan either, so I was hoping that he would. But at the same time, you kind of knew he wasn't, but you still went for the rest of the show, and you, you, like you said, you just kind of turned things off and enjoy it for what it was. Well, again, we're far from 1977 here. The Hogan era was very different than the Backlund era, than the Bruno era. Mm-hmm. You know, you when you went to see Bob Backlund fight one of the bad guys and, and fend off the latest challenge from Albano Blassie or the Grand Wizard, when Hogan came in, it, it, it changed. You saw, you came to see the superhero, Hulk Hogan, you know, just stamp out whoever he was wrestling and go home happy. And he, they were aiming for, for a younger audience, and it worked. Well, yeah, and I was a young audience at the time. Unfortunately, I never caught on to Hulkamania. I always latched on to the number twos and the number three guys throughout most of the 80s. So, it, you know, I, had, I enjoyed more of the undercard than I did the, the actual Hulk Hogan matches. I was always rooting for most of his opponents. Paul Orndorff, uh, certainly namely one of them. You know, I remember, and once again, we're way out of 1977. Sure, the Hulk Hogan, they had announced Bob Backlund versus Iron Sheik for the championship, and then... The week before the, that actual show, which was on a Saturday, they announced that Bob Backlund's shoulder was too injured, and instead the new champion Hulk Hogan was going to be wrestling the Iron Sheik. Uh. I get to the Garden maybe two hours early. You know, let's go to Faneuil Hall, get something to eat first. And there are people outside begging us to sell their tickets. The Garden had completely sold out. The the windows were closed. You know, big signs sold out, right. and people were dying to get in there. And I was like. Gee, maybe we should sell our tickets for a lot of money, but I'm glad we didn't because Hogan got a reaction like nothing else I had ever seen from a wrestling arena. I mean, the place was so hot for this new guy after six years of Bob Backlund, who was becoming more and more bland right. practically by the month. And, you know, just the, the excitement in, in the arena when Hogan came out to defend the championship against Iron Sheik was, I mean, it was electric, man. I can't. It was it was much like the Putski Grand match we just we were just talking about. Right, and I didn't mean to take you guys away from 1977, but it just, I just I, I do that rabbit hole thing sometimes, John. I <laughs> fall down a hole and get going. No, I kind of did that, and I apologize, but I thought that was, I I hope that was a cool story for you guys to hear from almost 40 years ago. My goodness, yeah, and uh, great memories, no doubt. But it's just it's funny to go back and look at this because every city has its own. It's you think it's easy if you're running a loop. You just kind of do the same matches, and a lot of territories did that throughout the week, depending on where the, the tapes were bicycled and things anyway. But up here, it seems like every major arena, there's Graham's defending his title against a lot of the same guys, but the months seem to be completely different. There's a lot of different booking going on, which really prevents you from doing any kind of big-time storylines on TV, because remember, that match with Maya Villa at the Garden and the whole ukulele angle, he doesn't work Maya Villa here in any of these other uh, cities. No, he doesn't. And I think, you know, I'm not sure why they did that. I mean, you know, you've got a nationally run angle for one match. Um, But getting back to what you were talking about, Ray, I mean, that was a lot of the fun of the WWF. Like 
before and, and this changed at uh, the very beginning of 1988 every city had a different show in in the WWF like you know i you could have Ivan Putski against Ken Patera in one town and Ivan Putski against Stan Stasiak in the next town and Putski against Baron von Raschke in the next city i mean it was totally different and it's always fun to look through the results i mean it, they they feel so so random sometimes but that's what made things interesting you know you, you never knew when they announced the next show, you never knew what they were going to say. Whereas when they changed the format in 1988, you know, every city was getting the exact same, same show. And I understood why they did it. It's just as a fan, it's not as exciting. No, right. And back in, in this era here in the late seventies or any time before this, let's say you're one of those fans that maybe you make a few towns. Maybe there's a couple of towns in your vicinity. You don't mind driving to you're getting a whole different, slew of matches potentially so it's it's not the same old lather rinse repeat that was me that was me in the early 80s i mean if i had the time and you know the wwf they weren't just coming to boston guard you know they were coming to your lo- you know, local high schools and you know in the in and around boston and if it was a wednesday night and i wasn't doing anything you know me and my friends would hop in the car and go and just you know have a night of, you know, it almost felt like names being picked out of a hat to wrestle each other. And that was part of the fun of it. All right, guys, let me uh, run through some of these other big towns just real quick. A few of the matches that Graham had. We already talked about Nassau with White Wolf and Haystacks. He also did a double DQ against Strongbow. Met wins over Zabisco, Guerrilla. Two matches with Putski here at Nassau. A DQ and a ca- countout wins both for Graham. And then Gorilla Monsoon ends the year. Graham picking up a count-out win over the big gorilla there. And then over in Landover in December, Chief J. Strongbow again getting a lot of these title shots. He gets quite a few title shots, just none of them at MSG, it appears. Strongbow winning a battle royal in December there in Landover before losing to Graham in the main event later on the show. Yeah, I mean, different cities got different names. And again, that's part of what kept it interesting. Another thing Graham did that Bruno did not do he defended the WWF championship in Atlanta, and he made more than one uh, trip to Florida to defend the title. Oh, excellent. Great segue into what we're going to get into here in just a minute. And right before we do, though, I want to point out there there's some other towns where they were wise to book the way they did, including Pittsburgh. Now, Dominic DiNucci, an Italian, of course, but uh, a quote-unquote local as far as the Pittsburgh territory goes. So Graham actually does a title defense against DiNucci even in Pittsburgh, and we've already talked about the Providence, Rhode Island title defense against Carlos Rocha, or Rocha. <laughs> <laughs> it was pronounced Rocha, Rocha, and I did not know Danucci got a title match in Pittsburgh. I mean, I hope they played up the local local guy trying to make good angle for that one, because the, Danucci clearly, I mean, I mean, I could have told you there was no way Dominic Danucci right. was ever winning the WWF championship, especially in 1977. I mean, he was already a guy not doing jobs on TV per se, but there could be a tag team match with the executioners against Dominic DiNucci. And I don't know, Frank Williams or someone like that. And DiNucci right. would be on the losing end. So it's, it's hard to push a guy like that as a main eventer. Right. Yeah. And for those who don't know, uh, Dominic, uh, very strong in the Pittsburgh territory, a great friend of Bruno San Martino, a Paisan of Bruno's. And uh, I guess if you were going to give DiNucci a title shot, Pittsburgh would be where you would do that. I don't have the full card in front of me, but I believe the situation was they did one of those battle royal gimmick there where uh, Danucci goes over in the battle royal and then gets the title shot later in the show to explain why someone of his level caliber, if you will, is getting the title shot. That makes sense if that's what they did, um, because you know, like I said, by that time, it had been uh, clearly established that Dominic Danucci, who is one of the few guys in the wrestling business who seems like universally beloved. Uh, I'm not saying anything bad about him. I'm just saying that by by 77, his the sun was starting to set on his career, to say the least. And you touched on it just a minute ago. But Vince McMahon Sr., he wasn't like his son. He had a lot of ties to some of the other promoters, some of the old guard. And it prove, it's proven here, at least in this Superstar Graham run. Bruno didn't really go around doing this too much. But Superstar Graham, he toured uh, quite a few territories here over his title uh, title run. Yes, he did. He made, again, more than one trip to Florida. I know he defended the title in Atlanta. I know he defended the title in Houston. Ray, do you know if he if he flew over to Japan when he was WWF champion? I believe he did, but I'm not positive. See, that's an excellent question, and that's one thing I did not research, I, and I should have, and that's I, I I, I, my swear. mistake, guys, and I feel like I'm going to have a part three with John. I don't know, you know, I know holidays are coming, and I don't know if 
you know, you're going to be able to make, make it to that episode, but that's something I will research. I, I feel like that's something important to touch on. If, if grandma stopped over in Japan during this uh, run. Yeah, I, I do know that, you know, again, not to crap on Superstar Billy Graham. That's that's totally not what I'm doing here because I was a big fan of Superstar Billy Graham's. Believe me, I was one of the few people who you know weren't completely turned off by him when he came back in 1982. Right. Um, you know, on one hand, Superstar Billy Graham to this day, almost 45 years later, Every time the subject comes up, he's as bitter as can be that they took the championship off of him, that they should have brought in Ivan Koloff and had Ivan Koloff bust superstar Billy Graham open as have him as the babyface champion instead of Bob Backlund. Yet at the on the other side of the coin, Graham says he was completely burned out uh, by all of the travel and all of the, the demands of the WWF champion. So. I mean, which way do you want it? You know, he said he was completely burned out. It was hard for him to get out of bed, but he still didn't want to lose the title. I mean, well, you got to make up your mind here. This had to be something that Graham would ha- would have had to have agreed to, I would have to imagine, to some degree, because Bruno never did this, certainly. And Backlund doesn't do this either, but Graham works a ton of territories. I'll start here. I'm looking at St. Louis. He goes down to St. Louis for, for right. Muchnick. He does a no contest with Dick the Bruiser. He gets a win over Bob Backlund on a countout, supposedly testing the waters for the title change the following year. True or not, I don't know. Uh, but it continues. He gets a win over Sergeant Slaughter, who was Bob Slaughter down there, and over Jimmy Valiant. So Graham works the St. Louis territory four times, and even as a favor to Vince and even much Nick and all that group, he goes down to the Kansas City territory after the St. Louis shows and works a couple of matches over there again over Bob Slaughter. And later on in August, he has what I'm sure was a great match, a a five-star, shout out to Dave Meltzer, match against Black Angus. Oh, man. I've seen pictures of that match. I have not. I'd love to see that. (laughs) I I, I mean, they did St. Louis on Friday, so I'm guessing if he stayed, they're they're using him in the Central States territory on a Saturday, which sounds like a real waste of superstar Billy Graham with the WWF Championship. I mean, Britain. Have a main event out here on a Saturday night in a, at a major arena. Yeah, you're not kidding. So uh, Graham does a couple of shots in Kansas City, and you know he's a real trooper if he's agreeing to go along with that. Working Black Angus, and Black Angus picked up the win, although on a DQ, guys. I just wrote UG in my notes because I started picturing how that match would have went. Yeah, that one sounds pretty <laughs> terrible to me, and I, I don't know much about Black Angus, but I mean, I, I can't imagine. I've seen pictures of him. I can't imagine him exactly being a Ric Flair caliber worker. No, there's there's a, there's a few matches of him out there, specifically from Japan. But uh, yeah, it's uh, everything you would imagine, and then some. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, everything I can imagine. I mean, yeah, you know, like I said, and and Graham, you know, he he talks so much about you know being burned out from all the travel, et cetera. And I I get it. You know, he and Backlund did things that you know Bruno was not having any part of. I know Bruno. Went to St. Louis when he was WWF champion, but I am completely unaware of him going to uh, Houston or or Florida or Georgia like like Graham and Backlund did. Right, and that's an interesting point too because here in Houston, they go to Houston in May, or Graham goes to Houston in May, which is right after he wins the belt from Bruno. In fact, Paul Bosch was advertising that Bruno San Martino was coming into town as the WWF champion, but by that point, Graham had won the title, so I'm assuming that was planned all along. Uh, I don't know that Bruno would have agreed to have went to Houston. So we get superstar Graham going down to Houston in May of 77 with a win over Mike York. Seems very unproductive, unless you're just shilling the fact that, hey, we have the New York champion down here because Mike York ain't really a uh, top challenger level there. No, Mike, the Alaskan Mike York was, I mean, every time I saw him, he was either at the bottom of the card or or losing on television, you know, something along those lines. What was really interesting, we talk about some of these shots that Graham's doing in other territories. He seems to work pretty steady in the Florida territory for Eddie Graham for the entire rest of the year from June to December. Graham is down there quite a bit, not just doing a shot here or there, but sometimes going there for several days at a time. We look in June, he's, he's wrestling Joe LaDuke and Ivan Koloff. In July, it's Dusty Rhodes and Graham, Rocky Johnson and Graham. In August, Graham over Kern, Rocky Johnson, Jack Briscoe. September, it's Dusty in Morocco wrestling against Superstar Graham and Ivan Koloff. And then from September through December, the final four months of the year, 
matches with Pedro Morales, Dusty Rhodes, and, and Don Morocco. So lots of Dusty Rhodes matches. You have to fi- figure the deal was in place there. Hey, we'll send Dusty up north if you send your champion down south. And not only that, but in 1976, Superstar Billy Graham left the WWF kind of in the middle of 76, right. went to go wrestle in Florida, and then came back to the WWF and won the championship. He was the Florida heavyweight champion and feuded with Dusty Rhodes. So he was already an established guy in Florida, number one. And number two, Dusty Rhodes had pinned Superstar Billy Graham in Florida. So if he could do it once, he could do it again. Right. And I don't have the title listings in front of me, but I think Graham left Florida still tag team champion. So I mean, with it, Ox Baker, I think yes, you're right. Yes, yes, and I'm I'm not sure if they drop the belts when he comes back there in June. I'm not sure if he drops the belts to the Briscoes or what they do with that. But I'm pretty sure Graham leaves to go to New York, still the tag team champion. So they, he certainly had ties to the Florida territory, no doubt about it. Yeah, he he. I'm I'm looking at the at the list now. It doesn't appear that he ever uh, defended the title in Japan, but he did defend the title in Charlotte. And he's kind of all over the place, St. Louis, Houston. So, I mean, good on him. He wrestled a very tough schedule. Right. And by the end of the year, he was even working the Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto. Matches over Stasiak and and Jay Strongbow. Yeah, and that's something they did. um, I believe Bruno occasionally defended the title uh, under Tunney in Toronto. And I know Backlund uh, defended the title frequently out there as well. So there it is, just in a nutshell, just... 1977, we're not even going to talk about a couple months heading into 78. Graham, the first real heel uh, with a run here as the champion, proved very successful, mostly sellouts at MSG, as you pointed out, other than the Maivia match. Every one of those garden shows, a sellout with the heel as the champion. Yeah, and a lot of it felt like, you know, okay, Bruno is, is finally out of the picture, and we're all a little bit sad about it, but now a guy like Ivan Putski is finally going to get his shot. Now a guy like Gorilla Monsoon, Chief J. Strongbow, they're finally going to get their opportunity. Uh, and, you know, obviously they they didn't win the title. And now w- once the the established guys all got their shots at Madison Square Garden and did not win, now we're bringing in the top baby faces from around the globe, namely Dusty Rhodes and Mil Mascaris. Right. And it's like you pointed out last episode of the show. Uh, if the babyface was champion, you kind of knew it ruled out the rest of the babyfaces getting title shots. It's just the way it was. There was no secondary title unless you wanted to count that uh, supposed uh, U.S. title held by Bobo Brazil. But uh, other than that, until the IC title is born in 79, there's really no secondary champion. So it's kind of like a breath of fresh air that we never got to see Putski or Strongbow or these guys ever get a run for the title. So it was, it was a pretty fun year. Yeah, and it was a, it was really kind of a turnaround because, you know, okay, Ivan Putski, you know, really, what what are his goals here, if we're being honest, right? right. I mean, he's, he's not going after the title, so, you know, what what is, why is, I don't want to say why is he here, I knew why he was here, but if you're Ivan Putski, why are you here? Now that's turned around, you know, what what is Ken Patera's role in this company? What is Spiros Arion doing? They're just kind of treading water the, as soon as Superstar wins the title. Yeah, so Graham, just a huge box office draw in the summer of 77, working with Bruno and Dusty on the smaller towns. It's Putski and Strongbow. Kim Patera, though, you just mentioned his name. He was working those B shows. If Graham was working the A shows, Patera was headlining those B shows. Patera, easily the number two uh, main event heel here. Without question, and part of me was waiting for Kim Patera to maybe turn babyface and have a run against Graham. That that never happened. They kept him fresh enough. So that when Backlund won the title and got through the rematches with superstar Billy Graham, they were able to have Bob Backlund versus Ken Patera on top. Uh, Same thing with Spiros Arion. So last episode, we looked at Bruno as champion and superstar Billy Graham returning. This episode, we've looked at Graham's run as champion. And now we're going to take a quick look here at what Bruno did post-championship run. And there's not a whole lot going on here. We did touch on that last episode that you went back and you noticed, hey, Bruno didn't wrestle as much as you thought he might have once he dropped that belt. No, he didn't. I figured he was full time, you know, just not in the main event anymore or 
uh, getting rematches against superstar Billy Graham. Bruno, more or less, like went into semi-retirement right away uh, upon losing the title. And, you know, again, I know I'm uh, dropping out of 1977. I assumed that in 1980, when he was doing the Larry Zbysko feud, he was wrestling full time then. No, he was like working once or twice a week just against Zbysko, just in the biggest cities. And that was it. Right. Yeah. And uh, John, I didn't tell you this yet, but I, I wanted to save it for the show. But let me explain to you. I don't, I don't really need to explain it to you, but let me explain to the people just how real Bruno's quote unquote legendary status is, because you said last episode, people throw the word legend around a lot and they do. I, I absolutely agree. But when it comes to Bruno, he deserves that title of legend. And I'm going to tell you why, because, uh, you know, I go online and I look up how my shows are doing the wrestling memory grenade, my one day Monday warfare show. And, and now the regional wrestling podcast, I look on the charts. I see where they're at on the charts. Would you believe that the inaugural, the debut edition of the Regional Wrestling Podcast was the number one wrestling podcast in Italy when it dropped? <laughs> That's fantastic. Can you believe that? I, and you I know mean, why, I, right? I mean, I have an idea why. It, Bruno Sammartino. Absolutely. So it's just crazy to go. But, you know, I did a show on Muda uh, many, uh, many months ago. It's probably been a, almost a couple of years ago now. And uh, our show hit number one in Japan when we when we did a show on the great Muda. And I really hadn't thought about it until after the fact to go, why am I number one in Japan? And then I realized, oh, OK, well, it was about Muda. And maybe they wanted to hear about his, you know, his time in the United States. But I really didn't see that one coming. You know, we I did a lot of uh, advertising and things like that online trying to promote the show. I think it was Bruno San Martino that sold the show over in Italy anyway. That that is really funny. You know, we have a, a Facebook group uh, for Stick to Wrestling. And, you know, if you're hearing this, you're invited to join. And uh, a friend of mine, Les Talk, he's been putting out like a slaughtering a sacred cow segment. So he, and he had one on Bruno San Martino. And he's like, look, Bruno... What you know, he wasn't a good worker, he wasn't a good talker, he was Italian and that and he was a strong man, that's why people bought into him. And I was like, Lex, you're just wrong. You're just <laughs> totally, totally wrong. Bruno had charisma. And I don't know how you describe charisma, but guys either have it or they don't. And Bruno was loaded with it. Bruno would get on TV and he would speak and people believed every word he said. And I go back and I listen to old Bruno San Martino interviews and you can see why he's humble, yet he is confident. And, you know, he, he speaks from the heart and he's very difficult to duplicate. I don't think it would get over today, but back in the seventies, when you had guys like, you know, regular sports stars, like uh, Tom Seaver or Joe Morgan, whoever they would get on, get on the microphone and they would just speak and be very humble and wrestling. You would have these crazy bad guys bragging and screaming things you didn't see from, from baseball players or basketball players. And it was so different, but Bruno was the guy who brought it back down to earth, and he did a far better interview than a, a Johnny Bench or a Tom Seaver. He was just really good at what he did, and he came across as being completely authentic. Yeah, I mean, he sold those shows. It wasn't just being Italian. I mean, he brought in more than just the Italians to the shows, although I, I have to admit, I'm sure there were plenty of them there. You're right. He, he talked people into the seats. You believed it. You wanted to see either revenge. You wanted to see Bruno do what he said he was going to do. And it was, it was never bragging. It was just confidence and it wasn't even cockiness. It was just, you know, this is what I'm going to do. It was like a very, it's, it, there's a really fine line there of, of humbleness, but confidence at the same time. And you know what? It, it, it gets even better because I remember as a, I had just started watching in like the beginning of 76 became a, you know, a casual viewer and Bruno would do his weekly interview talking about, you know, well, yeah, I'm looking forward to coming to Boston and about, you know, taking on Spiros Arion or Ernie Ladd or whoever. And then the Stan Hansen feud came along and Stan Hansen, you know, broke Bruno's neck legit. Mm -hmm. And they, they ran it as an angle and Bruno got on TV and Bruno was mad and Bruno was going to get <laughs> even. And it was like, you know, I remember as a kid just being like, oh, my God, this guy got Bruno mad. He's in trouble. Right, yeah, I can't imagine what that what that did for the uh, box office. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, Stan Hansen against Bruno San Martino after what what this guy did to Bruno. Look out! So, speaking of Bruno, though, here in '77, he loses the belt at the end of April. So, the final 
eight months of the year. He's no longer champion, but he doesn't really work a whole lot. And best as I can tell, he only chooses to work three specific arenas wisely. Those are where you're going to make your most money. Boston, Philadelphia, and of course, Madison Square Garden. And we'll start right off with uh, Boston here. Let's look at some of the stuff uh, Bruno does throughout the course of the rest of the year in the Boston Garden. Gets a couple of matches with George the Animal Steel, works Kim Patera, beats him in a Texas death match, and then finishes up the year in Boston against Fuji and Tanaka over the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. Yeah, and if I recall correctly, they had a couple of really weird shows in Boston. I think there was one where both superstar Billy Graham and Bruno Sammartino were no shows. And it was it was I want to say the end of the summer, I want to say August 77 um, or right around there. So it couldn't have been weather related. So I don't know what was going on. But I mean, you, you had to have a really unhappy crowd there. Right. And I'm not sure if it was Boston or Philadelphia here. I know what you're talking about, or at least I, I saw something similar to that. Now, it wasn't the same show. But there was a show where it was supposed to be Graham and Bruno in a title match, and then Bruno doesn't show up. And then the very next month, it's supposed to be the match once again, and then it was Graham or vice versa. One of them didn't show up the one month. The following month, the other one didn't show up. So both times, we don't get the match. And I don't know what was going on, but that was later in the fall. I also think that was during a few-week period where Graham was out with a leg infection. Okay, yeah, I'm looking at it now. It's it's October and November. November you, right. have it, yep. you have the story correct. That one month it was Bruno and the next month it was Graham. And believe it or not, if you didn't go to the Boston Garden or you didn't read about it in the paper, you didn't know about it. They didn't even mention it on television that, you know, if someone did no show. It was just like, you know, business as usual. <laughs> I was wondering how they handled that. Uh, such a big match. Uh, yeah. I mean, and, and they, they, I don't remember them mentioning because they had Putski as a sub for Bruno against Graham and, and Putski wins by count out. The next month, they bring it back in the cage w without mentioning the fact that San Martino had no-showed Boston. I really wonder right. what happened there because Bruno, Bruno no-showing, that's unheard of. Yeah, that, that really threw me off. Like the Graham one, I didn't really understand what was going on. I noticed he missed a few weeks there. That's when I did a little digging, found out that he had uh, an infection in his leg that he claims to set up. He, he says he got it in the spectrum. Doesn't really look right time-wise. I don't really know where he got it, but he said he'd split his leg open. And then, you know, those mats were never cleaned. You can only imagine all the stuff that got in his leg and oh, it yeah. became infected. So he was out for a few weeks there. He said that uh, actually he claims that promoter Vince Senior asked him, would you at least go out there on a gurney? Let us let the, let us show the people you're hurt. And that's why you're not. We want to show that off. And so he's like, are you joking me? But uh, I, I supposedly that's the story that happened there was uh, at least the initial story. Now, the Bruno part that really threw me off. I'm like, why is Bruno missing a show? That really confused me. And I still don't have an answer for it. Yeah, promoters like to do that. They they wanted to show the fans that if a guy can't wrestle, he's not sitting at, sitting at home, you know, watching TV, whatever. They want to show you that hey, he's he's not wrestling. And I can understand Graham not wanting to do it. I mean, especially if you know he you're not going to get better being on the road like that. Well, his response was he's supposed to be this larger than life Superman type heel character. And he's coming out showing you that, hey, I, ha I have this injury, so I can't work because my leg hurts. That, that was his story. Well, I mean, you can always put him out there in crutches and say that he was in, you know, he strained oh, yeah. or broke or whatever his ankle. You yeah, know, and I don't think I don't an infection. Right. I don't think that would have hurt him at all. But I get it. I mean, I, I get you have that option. I mean, he's been making the rounds, all these other territories in and out of Florida all the, for the second half of the year. So I get if he's like one night, he's like, you know what? I'm hurt and I'm done and I'm not going to come out tonight. Then I guess I get it. Well, if he's got a, a serious leg infection, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, it, it, the way the the business runs, I mean, we there were literally guys on crutches in the airport who, who worked their matches that right. night. I mean, right. you, you, don't, you didn't take a night off, but obviously, if Graham had a, a leg infection bad enough, you know, he has no he has no choice. Right. So Bruno, he works quite a few matches there in Boston, but over in Philly, has a couple matches with Kim Batera, a double DQ. And then they do the match with uh, the blood loss, Bruno picking up the win there. Gorilla Monsoon once again referee in that instance. That's the basically it. Gorilla Monsoon referee stops the match due to the blood loss on Graham. Bruno gets the win there in September, and then Bruno disappears. We don't Bruno see him again until the end of the year. He comes back for one match in December 10th, and that's at the, actually at the Spectrum. I'm not saying he's returning to the Spectrum in December. I'm saying he's returning to the ring, period. In December for one match, Bruno San Martino again defeating Graham, this time on a count out, just over 18 minutes when Graham just takes off, leaves ringside. So Bruno 
takes basically the entire fall into the winter off. Yeah, and that surprised me when I was looking up some of Bruno's results about a year ago. I mean, his schedule, you know, again, I just assumed that he was still wrestling at least, you know, part time in like 1978, 1979, because he was wrestling in the main event in Boston a lot in 79. But no, I mean, he wrestled like maybe 15 matches that year. So you would figure with Bruno dropping the belt that he's going to have some pretty big matches at MSG, at least the semi-main eventing the shows. So we go back and we'll look and see what happens here from May onward. When Al Graham wrestled Gorilla Monsoon in May at the Garden. Bruno here gets a win over George Steele. We're doing the blood loss gimmick again. George Steele bleeding profusely, as Gorilla Monsoon and many others would say. So... <laughs> There are only two things you can do profusely, bleed and apologize. And (laughs) it was originally supposed to be uh, Bruno against Steele for the title and Graham and Monsoon on the other undercard. undercard. But again, they just switch everything around when the the title switches. George Steele was ripped off. (laughs) Poor George. Can't get a break. Uh, now, George Bruno Steele is the only guy who got a title match against Pedro Morales, Bruno San Martino, Bob Backlund and Hulk Hogan. Oh, wow. I didn't think of that Hulk Hogan one. Yeah. Good call, John. Good call. Uh, someone else called. It was a trivia question. <laughs> <laughs> I, just I, I would have never thought of that because I was thinking about the, you know, the big arenas and everything. And I, I didn't, that didn't even dawn on me initially. Nope. George, the only guy. Wow. So Bruno works George Steele in what was to be a title match, but then he, we get return matches with Superstar Graham. We already talked about him in June. And again, in, in the beginning part of August, Bruno getting return matches against Graham in MSG, but why not have these matches, right? I mean, like, Bruno is no longer really wanting the belt. He has no plans on regaining the belt. But why bump him out of contention right away if you can make some more money with it? I, I Well, specifically in Madison Square Garden, I think they did what they needed to do. They had the two rematches. Uh, one of them is available on Peacock on the... It's on the best of Bruno San Martino. I, I'm sure it's not going to be easy to find, but it is. it is on Peacock. <laughs> and, you know, once again, you want to talk about a wild crowd. Just check this crowd out. It's it's the uh, from the August 1st, 1977 match with Gorilla mm-hmm. Monsoon as referee. Right. You know, it, it's not a high spot fest, but it's an excellent match. I, I strongly recommend it. Yeah, Bruno had a lot of matches that weren't high spot matches, uh, some of his challengers, but man. There's some of the loudest crowds. They really make the matches really over stuff and just good psychology. They they play to that crowd. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, the crowd lived and died with every one of Bruno's moves. It was insane. And you'd have that moment where, the, you know, the heel is pounding on Bruno and Bruno gets bloodied up. And finally, Bruno's had enough. He just like clenches up his fist and, you know. Yells Arr! and he goes after the guy, and the crowd is is as wild as a crowd can be. I mean, Bruno, he just had that it factor, and you know, like I said, it's it's a shame that you know Bruno got injured. Obviously, it's a shame, and that he decided he wanted out because I I, I in a way I wish I lived in that alternative universe where Bruno had the championship for a few more years. I really think it would have been successful, but I, he didn't I want agree. it anymore. Right. No, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I, I don't mind Graham's run here, but maybe give the, the the belt back to Bruno even. If if we could have done that, I would have been fine with that as well. But I agree with you, man. I would have liked to have seen what else he could have done. He was still successful. He went out on top. He really did. And he even goes out on top here in the Garden, at least for 1977. He gets a win over Kim Patera on August 29th in a Texas death match. And that's it for MSG and Bruno San Martino in 1977. Finishes up his final match at MSG in August of 77. Um, of course, he'll return to the Garden many times in the years in the la- in the later years, but here in '77, Bruno's done. Wrestles a total of one match in the final three months. We talked about that that being uh, at the Spectrum. So Bruno's pretty much he's done. Yeah, he went to wrestle for Dick the Bruiser in Indianapolis a little bit, but other than that, he was done. He was you know sitting on the couch and in, in, in Pittsburgh, and good for him. You know, he deserved it. He earned it. All right, we'll move away. We've talked so much the last couple episodes, and why not, about Bruno and Superstar Graham and the, and the WWF title. But let's talk a little bit about one of the other titles, well, the only other title at this point, and that's the WWF Tag Team titles. Of course, we talked at length about it last episode and everything that went on with those pesky executioners and Chief J. Strongbow and Billy White Wolf winning the titles at the end of the year in the Tag Team Tournament. And we, we fast forward here now to 1977, White Wolf, 
Strongbow, the champions. And we get a little bit of continuity at MSG as we start things off at the beginning of the year. January in the Garden, White Wolf and Strongbow defeat the Executioners in a two out of three fall match. Finally getting a legit pinfall win. It only took, what, seven, eight months? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I said this on the last show. They, they, they really drove that feud into the ground. I mean, by January 77, we had all had enough of that one. So the Native American team, and i got to put air quotes around that, do finally pick up the win there. And then we fast forward another month to February in the Garden, and they get a win over Nikolai Volkov and Torquemada. And there's some more continuity there because that's the team they defeated in the finals of the tag team title tournament back at the end of 76. So at least these teams are familiar teams they're, they're stepping in the ring with. We look again into March now at MSG. Once again, Kamada stepping in the ring for a title defense against the champs. This time he takes Stasiak on. As his partner, and once again, the champion successful, Strongbow and White Wolf over the team of Tor Kamada and Stan Stasiak. And March, believe it or not, marks the final title defense in MSG for the tag team champions. They do not defend the titles again in MSG. Yeah, and by that point, the the White Wolf and Strongbow team, I mean, they felt so stale. I mean, they, they came in, they were so hot. And, I, you know, I mentioned last week, I felt like the chase was too long for them uh, to win the t- titles from the Executioners. By the time they got the titles, I mean, you know, we never wanted to see that tag team again. They were just, you know, so stale. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that they wait so long to give them the belts. They give them the belts. By the time they give them the belts, it's like, all right, you guys aren't really that over anymore. We need to get these belts back off of you. And they're going to do that in a very interesting way. But they keep the belts here for just a little while still because they continue to work MSG split up into singles. For the next couple of months in April, they take on Stasiak and Gas House Gilbert in singles matches. More singles action in May at Madison Square Garden split up once again. White Wolf taking on Rocky Tamayo. Patera going into the ring against Chief J. Strongbow. They would still defend their titles pretty much everywhere else but Madison Square Garden against the likes of Baron Von Raschke and Stan Stasiak. A few other teams as well throughout April and May. That is until Billy White Wolf's injury, which we'll talk about here in just a few seconds. But it's very interesting that they continue to defend the titles on all the smaller towns, but on the big cities, they're already split up into singles. Yeah, and I think they did that because, I mean, really, who are they going to have them up against? You know, they, you've already had uh, Kamada and Volkov, Kamada and Stasiak. You know, the, back then, the WWF tag team scene, there was a, a heel tag team, a babyface tag team, and that was kind of it. The other tag teams were all just kind of thrown together. So the time comes, and it's, it's time to drop the belts, but they don't drop the belts in typical fashion. Instead, they wind up vacating the titles, and that's due to a storyline injury, although I've heard it's, it's a legit injury as well to Billy White Wolf, his neck and his back. Now on TV, and we're going to talk about this a lot more when we get to Kim Patera, who is, who is next on our list, but it's Kim Patera who takes Billy White Wolf out with the swinging neckbreaker, or as we called it when we were kids in the backyard, the spinning full Nelson. We called it the swinging neckbreaker. I always liked that one, a neckbreaker. <laughs> but Patera takes White Wolf out, and he, he never returns to the WWF rings, at least not for 13 years, under a, uh, another assumed name. You want to tell him who that is? Uh, yes, that was Sheik Adnan. And <laughs> I, I remember, you know, Billy White Wolf, his career was over, and I kind of took that with a grain of salt, except he didn't pop up anywhere else. Um, right. And then I remember, I want to say in 78 or 79, I read a result of him wrestling in Hawaii. So I'm, yeah. I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's trying to make a comeback in a smaller territory. And then in 81, I get uh, one of the after magazines and they've got this new guy, Sheik Adnan Al Casey, who is a, uh, he was a wrestler at that point. And just, you know, me being a dumb kid, I'm staring at the picture. <laughs> I'm like, is that Billy White Wolf? And yes, it was he just changed identities and it, it took him a, a good four years to get rolling again but he was back in the majors yeah you know i did a little research to see what he did after this and it seems like he had somewhat of a legit actual injury which is why he was out for such a long time but he did manage to go and do some shots over in hawaii in 77 here and in 1978 so you're correct on that as well uh, but he does wind up becoming Sheik Adnan Al Casey, and of course General Adnan with Sergeant Slaughter in the WWF as well. So it's uh, kind of interesting how he changed gears there. But Billy White Wolf is rode out, and again we'll talk about this more at length when we get to Ken Batera. Here we are. We have no tag team champions. Seems like we just had that issue back in the fall of '76, and here we are, the summer of '77, in the same situation 
no tag team champions for the better part of two months here in the WWF until Mr. Fuji and the Professor Toru Tanaka, the, they were technically the plant successors, and I've read stories that maybe they were supposed to wrestle Strongbow and another man and, and win the titles, but Tanaka comes in and almost immediately gets injured. So he can't even team with Fuji here for a little bit, but eventually they are granted the titles. They win the titles in a quote-unquote tournament. I had no idea Tanaka got injured. Yeah, I, I did a little research, and I also looked through the results, and I see, yeah, Tanaka disappears there for a little bit right around this time frame, which made a little sense. Oh, I, I, you know what? Now things make a little more sense because I, I know that they had planned on Tanaka and Fuji coming in and winning the championships, and if Tanaka got hurt, uh, they had to you know change the plan and, and go with what they had because I always thought that was really goofy booking. But if Tanaka was hurt, which I did not know until this very moment, okay, I under, I understand why now. Right, and uh, typically there was usually one heel team, one babyface team. Sometimes you had that third team floating around as well. And Tanaka and Fuji win the belts. They're they're given the belts. They win it in a tournament. They're pairing off mostly here with the team of Tony Gurria and Larry Zbysko. Yes, and Zabisco and Gurria were kind of that underneath team. You know, they didn't they didn't team together uh, all of the time. You know, like Tanaka and Fuji, for example. But they they were mostly singles wrestlers, but they were each other's regular tag team partner. And you know, when they finally won the titles from the Valiants, it was like, uh, you know, oh, it's finally happened for them. The dream has come true. And you know, of course, excuse me, they didn't win them from the Valiants. They won them from the Lumberjacks. Lumberjacks, right. And then uh, the next week, the Valiants debut on TV. I'm like, you know, it was so obvious <laughs> what was going to happen next. I mean, they, they, they booked the tag teams, I think, in a, a very lazy and, quite frankly, in a poor manner in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah, it was uh, in a very obvious manner as well. Like, you kind of knew what was happening here. Oh, these these yeah, guys I mean, are out and these guys are in. Yeah, I, I mean, one example <laughs> um Lou Albano in 1980 is managing the Samoans and they are the tag team champions. And Albano brings in a new tag team, the moon dogs, <laughs> dogs right. where the Samoans even lose the belts. I mean, right. it was, it was you know, poor quality control in my opinion. <laughs> so Fuji Tanaka, actually they come back in May. Tanaka's injured for a little bit there, but they do get the belts and uh, they work quite a bit with Korea and Sabisco on the house shows. As they are the new tag, the three time, I believe, tag team champions now at this point yes. are Fuji and Tanaka because they had won the belts back in 72 and 73 as well. So people don't, yeah, and people that might not know that, uh, Fuji and Tanaka had been here prior. No, they had been. And back then they were managed by the Grand Wizard of Wrestling. And I was a little, you know, and I knew that. And I was a little bit surprised when Fred Blassie was their manager this time around. And we. Move ahead a little bit here. TV taping, Fuji and Tanaka defeat Gurria and Zabisco. Uh, this was taped at the Philadelphia Arena. It doesn't air until October 1st. And so unlike last year, even though this was a tournament of sorts, we only see the finals on TV. So this is where they win the belts on October 1st TV or maybe a couple weeks later there in the Boston market, as you talked about. I know I'm not talking about the restaurant. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> Right now, if we may, let's bring on Tony Gurria and Larry Zabisco and get their reaction to wrestling for the championship in Madison Square Garden. And uh, as I understand it, uh, Fred Bassey will be nowhere around ringside. Well, you know, man, that's the first thing we made sure of when Tony and I signed for this match is under the conditions that Fred Blassie be barred from that ring because, uh, you know, we, you saw it on TV. Blassie had the referee out of the way. Uh, the, the man's a master uh, when it comes to interfering and all that, but he will not be at that ring. And uh, I think uh, that's, you know, that naturally that's in uh, Tony and mine's favor, but uh, he won't be there. We made sure of it. Tony, are you confident that uh, you fellows are going to be victorious? Well, we're confident, Vince, but we're not overconfident. They've got, a, they've got a weak link in that team, and that's Tanaka's leg. We know that he did hurt his leg. And that's what we're going to go to work on. And we feel that if we can tear that leg down and he can't continue, then they've got to give the match to us because no way one man is going to take on two. They're a very good team. But like I say, they have that weak link, weak link and we're going to go for it, which is Tanaka's leg. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, from Tony Garia and Larry Zabisco and a very hopeful tag team combination. So Fuji and Tanaka, now the tag team champions heading into the new year, the rest of the year, it's mostly Korea and Zabisco, but there's also a new tag team that's on again and off again for the remainder of the year, that being the team of Chief J. Strongbow and his new partner, the High Chief Peter Maivia. 
Yeah, and I was I was under the impression that uh, Strongbow and Maivia were going to win the championships. You know, I have that little kid logic going on. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, yeah. you know, Strongbow was champion with, with White Wolf, and Maivia seems like he's a better, more successful wrestler than White Wolf, so why not? But they, they never did that. It, you know, and it really threw me off as well. And I, obviously this happened before I was even watching wrestling. But when I go back and I watch this stuff, and, and I and I did when it first came onto the network, and, and, and I've been collecting tapes for nearly 35 years. But when you put these two in the ring together, something special happens. Not wrestling-wise, but, I mean, you got two guys with pretty damn good gimmicks in there for the time. They're both over with the fans. You can consider them both, quote-unquote, semi-main eventers, if you will. It just seemed like these two guys were special. They had a, a charisma or a charm to them where you bought them more as champions than even than even Agoria and Zabisco, who were just, I, I don't want to say bland. I, I've always liked Zabisco's work. But in general, if you look at these two teams, I would have gave the nod to Strongbow and Maivia. That would have been my guess. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Strongbow and Maivia were, would go out there and... You know, they would be, frankly, goofy, but, I mean, the, the, it entertained the crowd. They would do their antics, and they would, you know, do high fives and whatever, and the fans got into it, and, you know, that's what wrestling's all about. All right, guys, and uh, I apologize to you guys, and then I apologize to you, John. I'm, I'm running short on time here. I got to go make a stop and pick up my son, but I wanted to leave you with a question before we close this sure. episode. Question to you, John. You lived through these eras. Who was more over, the Executioners as a heel team or the team of Fuji and Tanaka? Uh, definitely the Executioners, but okay. if you wanted to ask me who was the most over between the Executioners and Fuji and Saito, it was Fuji and Saito. Okay. But that's not 77. Right. No, I was just trying to get a, get a guess of when the tag team division was more over. Was it 76 or 77 here now that we have Tanaka and Fuji as the champions? I, I was just curious. I felt that, that the answer was probably going to be Executioners as well. But I just I wanted to ask somebody that lived it and, and remembers it. You know, the executioners, I, I thought Fuji and Tanaka were a step down from the executioners. Um, the executioners were these two great big guys under masks, and they looked very intimidating. And, you know, nothing against Fred Blassie, but I always thought Lou Albano was a way better manager than Fred Blassie. Al Albano, especially during this time frame, was just phenomenal. He was a real slime ball. Uh, or, or he came across that way on TV, and it right. just got over like crazy. Everyone and, and, hated Albano. And there's a lot of Fuji and Tanaka footage out there, so you can kind of gauge the fans' response to them also from their TV tapings versus the audio that I played last episode from the Executioners. Those fans really hated the Executioners, so it seemed to me, although, to be fair, they were working against Strongbow and White Wolf, so the crowd was on another level as well there, but it just seemed like... Well, with Albano in your corner, though, you're always going to get that extra heat. Exactly. And you brought up a good point, too, that the executioners had that, you know, super team of Strongbow and White Wolf to, to pair against. Tanaka and Fuji really didn't have that level of challenger. I mean, you say, well, they, well you had Strongbow and Maivia, and you just said Maivia was better than White Wolf. But Strongbow, it's like, you know, you have your first bite of that delicious steak. Now you're getting towards the end of the stake with Strongbow. Right. You're getting full. You've already had, you know, you know what I'm saying? It was like Strongbow was great when he first got here. But as the year wore on, especially towards the end of 77, the gimmick kind of wore off. Right. And we had just seen Strongbow in this tag team situation as well. So you're repeating the same story with one of the same yes. guys. That probably didn't help things either. No, I, I, you're completely correct on that one. I mean, the, the newness was gone on Strongbow, and you know he just got more and more stale over time. I, looking back, I'm surprised he lasted until 1979. Wow, that's that's an excellent point. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, luckily he was gone for the time he was. I think that really helped him when he came back with the White Wolf story. It was he wasn't gone that long, uh, but it felt like it, it felt like a good break from Strongbow, but towards the end of 77, like I said, I mean, he was, he, you know, I remember him debuting in 1976, this crazy guy comes out of, the, out of the dressing room to save Billy White Wolf, and now he's the guy who's been on television for a year and a half now. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up there, John. I do apologize again. I just, my schedule's out of whack this week. They're heading to the holidays, and I mm -mm. have some things I need to go do. But, John, no I appreciate worries. you coming back. You promised you would be here for episode two, and you kept your promise. You kept your word, and I appreciate you so much for being a part of this and talking all about 1977 Superstar Grand Bruno Sammartino, the tag team champions. 
Uh, I got a lot more to discuss. I, I clearly, we, we wanted to wrap this up in two episodes. This is going to have to be a three-parter. So for those looking for us to close up shop here, I apologize. Uh, I got so much more to cover still. I've got to talk Kim Patera, his run in the company here. Bob Backlund's time, 77, a little bit on Strongbow, Dusty, Putsky, Maivia. Just kind of a quick run through of some of the other talent that come in here from Haystacks, Calhoun to Lenny Hurst, Dewey Robertson, uh, Stasiak, George Steele. We're going to look at why he wrestles quite a bit more in the summer. I wonder why that is. We'll talk about that next time here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and we can talk about the tag team, uh, the very unique tag team of Dynamite Jack Evans and a Pretty Boy Larry Sharp. There you go, and they are on my list. I'm looking right at it right now. And the Golden, or excuse me, the Iron Creek Spiros Arion will return before the end of the year as well. So many guys to still talk about. Uh, it's going to go flow a little faster. These guys didn't quite main event the entire year, so it's it's not a big long story like it like it was with Bruno and, and Superstar Graham. But, John, I appreciate you returning for episode number two. And if time permits, we would love to have you back for the final chapter of 1977 in the WWF. For sure. Hey, I'm looking forward to being on the number one podcast in Italy one more time. <laughs> number one wrestling twice. podcast in Italy. I'm, oh, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, hey, we talked Bruno. Here. We got we to gotta figure out a way to put Bruno into the next episode, too. Just keep it flowing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but, John, I do. I appreciate you again for being here for the second episode of the original wrestling podcast yeah and you know thank you for having me i had a good time hanging out and i want to wish everyone a, a and your family a happy holiday for whatever you celebrate and i'll share those sentiments with john want to wish everyone a happy holiday season and that includes happy new year as the next time we return it will be 2023 when we wrap things up here with 1977 in the wwwf Until then, thanks again to John McAdam, and I am your host, Ray Russell. Thanks for listening to Regional Wrestling, where we talk the territories. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol?